Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rajiv Eskana from Immigration.com, the law office of Rajiv Eskana PC. Um, this is our bi-weekly telephone call. Today is February 7th, 2019. Uh, we had some difficulty with starting the recording, and there were a bunch of glitches, not sure what's going on. There were some upgrades in our software. It appears they've created more problems than solved. That said, right. that should be okay. We can still go on. I'm going to mute everybody so I can answer the questions first, and then we'll take uh, follow-up questions on that, okay? Training, okay. Itne mein hum khol lenge. We are all set. Ek do main, do maine mein maximum do maine kya raho? All right, folks. Uh, getting back to what I was saying. So, the first frequently asked question is: Is H four EAD tied to an employer? And the answer is no. An H four EAD is neither tied to a particular employer nor to a revoked I-140 if the I-140 was stayed approved for 180 days and any one of those 180 days fell on January 17, 2017. So let me explain what that means. Let's say that in this case we had uh, Dr. Tom saying that he's moving from employer A to employer B. Employer A already had an approved H-4080 for his wife and employer B has also filed can can she continue working on the old H-4080? And the answer is yes, as long as it is valid. She, the new employer didn't even have to file another H-4 or H-4080. Similarly, if an I-140 is approved, stays approved for 180 days, and then it is revoked by the old employer, it can still be used for H-4080. I hope that makes things clearer. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question on this, press star 5 on your phone, sir, or ma'am. I hope you can hear me. Okay, next one is frequently asked question about naturalization. So what if I ended up staying outside USA for more than six months, but I have a good reason for it. To stay outside is less than one year, more than six months. And the answer is yes, if you have a good medical reason like you do, you should be able to explain that delay. If she's not able to travel because of surgery and because of extended physical therapy, I think you should be okay. Now, the part about receiving public assistance and how that affects naturalization is a lot more difficult to answer. It used to be simpler, and it probably still is because the new regulations are not in effect. It used to be that if you had long-term care in a residential facility like an old people's home, or you were getting cash money from the government as supplemental income, you could not then, you could then be deported actually. But now, government has been trying to make this a lot stricter. However, it's not in effect yet. So I don't see why this should be a problem. In my view, you should be okay with this. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Okay, good. At least now I know that you can hear me. Um, this is from New York. There's a follow-up question. Uh, go ahead. I can hear you. Hello? Hello? I can hear you. Go ahead, talk. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for your time, uh, Mr. Rajiv. Uh, of course. Uh, um, so, uh, just, uh, so the, the reason we were worried is because, you know, she had before the, you know, as I said, uh, the five-year statutory period, she, they had uh, uh, about uh, a long stay too. Although you know we waited uh, until it's over, uh, the, uh, mm -hmm. the five within the five year period, uh, there's one uh, 193 days. So you know if we just provide the medical um, uh, necessity uh, you know letter from the doctor in India, um, that would that suffice? I mean, do you think? Uh, we yeah, can, I uh, would. I would. If I were you, I would also provide hospital bills, proof of hospitalization, all those things together. Okay. And uh, did you think it would be necessary or better uh, to, uh, uh, you know, hire a local law lawyer, attorney to accompany them, or is that? Uh... Uh, which which city are you? Lo well, you are in New York. Um, I look having a lawyer does help, especially where you have some things that might need to be argued. So yes, if you can get a local lawyer, that might be a good idea. 
And one, one uh, another thing is, so is it, do you think it will be uh, better to wait for like another a month or two when they would be, you know, uh, into the uh, like a four year period since the last 180 day uh, um, stay? Uh, that way they'll have that, um, you know, the rule which says that, you know, you can uh, apply after four years and one day. Although, you know, it's for... That's uh, only for of, those people, only for those people who have a re-entry permit. Did they have a re-entry permit? No. Yeah, the four-year one-day rule does not apply to normal people. It applies only to people who have a re-entry permit. Okay. And, and uh, in um, terms of public charge, um, so it's like... Uh, so it's it's more of a premium subsidy, a tax. Yeah, uh, I subsidy. don't think, sir. I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna cut short the conversation because I gotta go on. But in my view, it's not a problem. I don't think it's an issue. But wait and watch, see how it works out. Personally, I think it'll be fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good luck, sir. Okay. Uh, all right, folks. Let's go on to the next question. Next frequently asked question is about the University of Farmington, Michigan. You know how I set up a sting for that university. And so far, I think they have indicted eight or nine people, only those people who were actively involved in the fraud. Uh, but the question here is from Abhishek Verma. There was an ICE raid on students. I was temporarily enrolled for a year and a half I left USA on my own 2018 May. Then the university eventually terminated my service for non-payment in November 2018. I'm trying to apply for a tourist visa. The problem is tourist visas are such weak visas. They can be denied for a thousand reasons, including a reason saying, we don't believe you're going to come back. And there's hardly anything you can do about it. So is this going to help you, hurt you, the history with the Farmington? Impossible for me to predict. It is completely up to the consular officer. In my past experience, whenever we had these fraudulent university cases come up, government did put people through extended questioning when they had associations with these universities as students or as participants, but eventually they were okay. They got their visas. However, tourist visa itself is, is a visa that can be denied on so many grounds. It is difficult to predict. You can try. Just make sure you don't make any misrepresentations or active concealments of facts because that can lead to a permanent bar from entering the United States. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five. Star five. Okay, no question. Let's go on to the next frequently asked question, which is doing business while on H-1B. So they have watched my previous videos Mr. or Ms. Parihar, and understood that you can apply for even concurrent H-1B when you want to do business for your own company. I want to be actively involved. I have three questions. I will open an LLC or any other entity that my CPA suggests. I want to start a simple e-commerce business selling online on a website, such as Amazon, uh, selling on a platform such as Amazon. How tricky is to get approved for concurrent H-1B. I think the problem here is, I don't think we can prove that your job requires a bachelor's degree. So unless the job requires a bachelor's degree in a specific subject, we cannot get an H-1B for that job. And it's not the, uh, there is no startup capital requirement for an H-1B. Directly, there is no such thing. But of course, indirectly, the government can say that we want to uh, be assured of the veracity of the company. We want to know that you have enough money or startup money to secure the job. They usually don't ask. In fact, there are rulings which, which prevent the government from asking these questions about the money. The concurrent H-1B is cap exempt. It is not subject to the cap. If your main H-1B is already capped, you've gone through the quota once, concurrent H-1B will not be under the cap. The difficulty I see is that your job is not specialty occupation. Other than that, I think it can be done. Star five, if you have a follow-up question on this, star five. I see you're on the, on the phone, actually. I, I see your name, but maybe it's not the same person. Yeah, it is. Okay, yeah, I saw your name. Okay, um, this is from Delaware. 
Go ahead, I can hear you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering the question. So, um, so the only uh, option for me, so if you say that I can't do e-commerce or Amazon business, then uh, what would be the second best option for me? It, you have to have, your role in the company should be one that is directly related to your field. I'll give you an example. We had uh, a few years ago, we had somebody from MIT who had a PhD in, uh, I, I think, some branch of uh, computer engineering. And they started their own company uh, with seed capital from MIT. Their role was not that of a CEO, et cetera. Their role was a technical role. So even though they owned majority stock in the company, their own role in the company was technical. So I think something like a CTO or a, a lead engineer, something like that. So if your job that you're going to do for your own company is not related to your own discipline, that's not going to work. Okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Good luck. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Okay. So... Those were all the frequently asked questions we had today. I have told them to cut off the questions at 15 or 16 because it gives me a little bit more time if we can get time. Today we got delayed because of the technical glitches we had with the conference call software. Um, but normally we have a little bit more time. Today I don't know if I will, but I'm going to do the rest of the questions that are not frequently asked. Krishna, on April... 2018, my employer filed H1 B extension, H4 extension, F1 OPT to H4 for my wife. We've received H1 B, H4 extension, but wife's F1 to H4 is still pending. Does she accrue any unlawful presence? The answer is no. As long as a timely filed extension, if you had filed after her OPT had expired, uh, even the 60 day grace period had expired, then you would be running unlawful presence. But if you timely file an extension application, there is no unlawful presence. Star five, if you have follow-up questions, star five. Okay, so this one is from California. California, go ahead, please. We can hear you. Yeah, hi, Rajiv. Uh, actually, my wife, uh, I mean, did master's in Silicon Valley University. So that university, okay. like, you know, uh, closed their service system by uh, 2018, June, June 30th. And we filed uh, F1 to H4 in April, so we are uh, we fi we change change of status like you know three months four months before that. So um, she is good, right? The I think she's good, but the problem is here's the issue. Look, uh, there have been some changes in the way they are dealing with students now. Previously, it used to be that you would not start accruing unlawful presence as a student unless government found some violation and said so in writing. Now, the new Trump administration's um, interpretation of the regulations, which I think is horrendous, it's actually being sued on. I think there's a lawsuit pending in North Carolina, which said, well, you automatically start accruing unlawful presence if there is any violation of student status. So can we say that her admission in Silicon Valley itself was a violation of status because the university had issues? Maybe. So if we were that tough about our interpretation, then she has been accruing unlawful presence for a long time. But if we are more reasonable, then our unlawful presence shouldn't begin, begin to run because the university was in good status when you filed the case. So it all depends upon yeah. how the government interprets the case. Okay. okay? So unlawful presence... One, one, one quick thing. One, one quick thing. People whose unlawful presence began before August 9th, 2018, are set to start accruing unlawful presence from August 9th. So August 9th from now is over 180 days, but less than one year. One option you have is to just go ahead, send her outside USA, get her H4 visa stamping and bring her back. We know that she doesn't have, um, she doesn't have, uh, well, we hope she doesn't have 10 year bar. These bars can also be waived through a 212D3 waiver, which can be quite useful. Not enough time to go over all of that, but that's one of the options. You should talk with your lawyers about that. Okay? Okay. So she can go outside while uh, in one petition is in process? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, but just so, just to touch base with your lawyers to make sure that you understand all the implications of that decision. Okay. Sure. Yeah, I will do that. Thank you. Good luck, sir. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Um, this is one thing I couldn't understand whether this was a case of a uh, same-sex couple or different sex couple. So I do not know. I can't tell from the from the question. So the question number five was, I'm an Indian national living in India with my partner, who is a U.S. citizen. So partner is a little ambiguous. I do not know if that means you are same sex or different sex. Her work finishes this May end, and thus we are hoping to get back to the U.S. Staying together is our primary concern. Uh, she has to stay in the U.S. given that she needs to be there for her aged family. Don't get a tourist visa because if you come to USA on a tourist visa with an intention to get married here and stay here, government can consider that to be fraud. So you could apply for a fiancé visa then, but, but the only problem is if you're a same-sex couple, that I don't know how that would work out. I'd have to look at that. Uh, India doesn't allow, I don't think they allow same-sex marriages yet. Uh, so you could go to a third country get married, apply for a green card, or apply for a fiancé visa. I think fiancé visa should be allowed because it doesn't require any specific celebrations or technical formalities in the host country. So even if India doesn't recognize, again, I'm, I, I could be wrong, maybe you're not same-sex, but it doesn't really matter. Fiancé visa is the better option. It takes a long time, several months to get through, but that's the best, best way to do it. You could be stuck for a while. But that's the only thing that makes sense. If you were to get married, you would have to go to a country, if you are a same-sex couple, go to a country where this kind of marriage is recognized and then uh, come back to India and apply for a green card. You could do that as well. But it's that's going to take about a year, year and a half. I don't know how long the fiancé visa would take. Hopefully a little less than a year, but that would also take time. Nevertheless, that's the best way to do it. Um, if she, If your partner has enough money in USA, she can definitely sponsor you and you don't have to have your own property. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. So fiancé visa is what you should focus on, in my opinion. Okay. Next question is Girish Pingle, I-140 is approved in EB3. Dates advance. Is employer required to, required, is employer required to file I-485? It has to be done through the employer because I-485 with the sponsoring employer, and you have to have the same employer who sponsored the I-140, and they must have the intention to hire you. Otherwise, you can't file 485. Um, so that answers actually all your questions. Is employer required to hire some external attorney? No, you can hire your own lawyers. That's not a problem. A lawyer is not required, but in a case like this, you should hire a lawyer and you can pay for it. Once 485 is filed, is it correct that after 180 days the employee becomes eligible for portability? Yes, that is correct. Let us say one gets the job portability benefit, 180 days have passed. What is benefit in waiting for the final action date to be current? Um, there is a problem in the interpretation of AC21. Uh, people have created some doubts. I don't have the exact issue in front of me. So if I had, the, if you're on the phone, you can ask me in more detail. But there have been some issues about the interplay between filing date and something like CSPA, Child Status Protection Act. I don't see there should be any problem with AC21 because the language simply says that the 485 is filed and has been pending 180 days. It doesn't look to filing dates or final action dates. I think that's not an issue here in AC21, as far as I know. For CSPA, it is. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Star five. You know, it's interesting how when you're talking about technical issues, unless you're directly involved, it sounds like Greek and Latin to other people, right? Okay, let's go on to the next question. Supriya, responded to the second RFE for my H-1B amendment related to change in work location, Chicago. However, we anticipated denial as the project now is getting over uh, in the meantime, my H-1B expires in another six months. My employer wants to file an extension uh, with the original location. 
uh, is it possible to apply for the H-1B extension? Yes, it is. Actually, there are, there's another question further down on something similar. Uh, the way this works is, let's say that your H-1 is good till June 1st. And you applied for an amendment, let's say, in April, before the H-1 expired. And then in May, you applied for an extension. That is absolutely without any problem because you applied for an extension within the life of the existing case, which was expiring in June. Let's take a different hypothetical. You filed an amendment. This time, you filed an extension in July. In July, your, your previous H-1 has expired. So now you are depending upon your amendment to give you status. And I think even that would work out. This is what we have been doing. We have been arguing with the government that the amendment when it was filed was perfectly legal. It isn't our fault that you sit on a case for eight months and the project gets over. So they have been approving our cases uh, where there was an intervening amendment and even the amendment project expired, but we have another extension filing. Uh, so they will give me extension if I can prove in the extension that the intervening case was appropriately filed. So definitely that is a possibility. I don't know how it will play out for you. Uh, press star five if you have a follow-up question. Press star five. Okay, no follow-up question. Let's go on to Stetch, who has a naturalization delay. My application has been pending since November 2018. Uh, I look if it is first of all it doesn't hurt to open a, um, a a a request a service request so you can call the customer number customer service number and ask them about what the status of your case is they won't tell you exactly what the status is but at least if there's an un, uh, extraordinary delay they can make a make a note on the file okay so another thing you can do is just contact your congressman's office local congressmen, whether senator or house of representatives, and ask their help, they are only too glad to follow it up for you. That would be the easiest thing to do. Star five, if you have a follow-up question, star five. Okay, let's go on to the next question, which is from Nisargam CA. I'm on H1B, wife and son on H4, date is Feb 28, 2019. Employer has filed amendment plus, plus extension and extension for wife and son in July, way back in July 2018. I've completed four years and two more, year, more years are remaining. My sister-in-law has filed I-130. Can I file I-485 after my I-94 expires? The answer is after your I-94 expires, but the case is still pending. And the answer is probably not. See, if you are an employment-based 485, you have a grace period of 180 days. But the 240 days that you're talking about, that's just authorized period of stay. You cannot file 485 until your case is decided in your favor. Star five, if you have a follow-up question. Okay, oh, you have one more question. Let me answer that, I see you. You had one more question, which is, if my case is denied, what happens? Well, you have two choices. You can convert your green card to consular processing and just get a green card from India and come back. Or you can go to India, get an H-1B, come back again, then file 485. Okay. Let me, uh, let me, this is from Illinois. Yes, Illinois, go ahead. And thank you for your patience. You've been waiting a long time. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, my question is uh, now uh, I see in visa bulletin that I can file I-485. So uh, right. is it uh, uh, good if I can file uh, before uh, my uh, I-94 and visa expire? Oh, yes. For... If, your, if your I-94 is still valid and you are still maintaining status, working according to the terms of your H-1B, please file 485 immediately if you are um, eligible to file the 485. So, sir, one question. Is it not uh, conflict like I am uh, in one way I am... Uh, 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 asking for a non-immigrant uh, non immigrant status. And, oh, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. Do a Google search on uh, H-1B dual intent. H-1B okay. is a dual intent visa. It allows you to have a green card. Okay, because I am, okay. One, at no one side, I am applying for uh, uh, No, 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 that's not an I, issue. 
no no don't don't spend time okay. on that that's not an issue okay. you can do this okay 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 thank you sir yeah you're welcome you're all set good luck thank you all right so yeah so h1b is without doubt as a part of the statute it's written by congress into the law h1b's are dual intent visas just because a green card is pending is not a ground for denial of your h1b okay <laughs> pokre pokre says i'm completing my masters degree in us in 2005 i was issued an h1b visa i used it till 2009 for about 3 years then upon losing my job in 2009 um i received a denial notice i left usa see when you have been outside usa for one year you have a full 6 years okay you can no longer use the remaining 3 years because your h1b was approved more than 6 years back in the past so as far as i can tell you can have all 6 years but you'll have to go through the quota Once I give up my current citizenship, can I still use the remaining? See, the remaining three years are a problem because your case was approved more than six years ago. That's why you can't relate back to that case. You have six years of H-1B now. Whether you change your naturalization to Canada or remain an Indian, it doesn't really matter. You still have to go through the quota because your H-1B was approved more than six years ago. That I think is the problem. I don't think you'll be able to to be exempt from the quota. You should go through the quota system. Star five, if you have a follow up question, star five. Okay. So this one is from Canada. Ah, uh, go ahead, Canada. Hello, hello, sir. Uh, I have one question. If this situation six is over, but I one forty is approved, and four eighty five is pending since two thousand seven. then still they need to go quota or without quota they can come well if your i140 is approved i think it can be argued that you are not subject to the quota there are some technical reasons i can't really go into the details but if your i140 is approved in your kind of situation uh, you can argue that i still i'm not subject to the quota i should be allowed to get my extension i don't know how that would play out it's really um not even a tertiary but a quaternary issue of law ultimately it depends upon the how how the government interprets your case doesn't hurt to try but i think applying through the quota is a very good option okay, okay sir thank you oh you're welcome good luck thank you okay so let's go on to the next question I'm currently working as a contractor for my client h1b is valid till may 20, may 19th or may 2019 they want to take me on full time current employee is going to apply for an extension uh, can i apply for um, a transfer at the same time and the answer is sure i just went through this especially if you if you apply before may 19th there is no question about it after may 19th if an extension is pending uh, you can rely upon that extension to still get status within usa but applying before may 19th if you have an extension pending a transfer pending no problem at all star 5 if you have a follow up question star 5 okay let's go on to the next question um this one is from pavan 28 i have my current 797 and visa stamp from employer a so it's an h1b visa but through employer a i moved to client position employer b started working on receipt notice now if i travel can i come back uh, and the answer is yes you can and you can use employer a's visa to travel even though you are in the process of transferring over to b uh, even if they revoke your case i don't think it's a problem you should be able to travel are there any chances that premium processing will be open on february 19th i have no idea no idea can't really answer that question but traveling while a transfer is pending is perfectly legal star 5 if you have follow up question star 5 okay Oh there is a follow up question. Let's see. This one is from Arizona. Yeah, Arizona, go ahead please. Hey Raju, it's Pawan here. So thanks for answering my question. So now uh, I have a follow up question that if the employer A revokes my 797 petition, 
So right. what do I need to show? Like, what do I need to tell him? Uh, uh, you know, when I come back. You don't really you just need the receipt notice of the transfer um, and your visa stamp. That's all you really need. So if the immigration officer asks which company you're working for, should I tell my... You tell them the truth. Company? You always, always tell them the truth. It's legal for you to move over to a new employer once you file your paperwork for transfer. Right. So okay. what do I get on the, uh, the data, I-94 data? I mean, like, uh, will they give based on the visa? It's, it's they, will, the they will give you an I-94, I would, I would think, only coextensive with your approval notice of the old case. They won't go beyond that. Even though it is revoked, right? Even though it's revoked, yes. These are issues that are not covered in the regulations, but it there clearly is policy that says you can travel while an H-1B transfer, H-1B amendment, or H-1B extension is pending, as long as you have a visa stamp and you are still within that visa and you are within that period, it's not like your visa has expired. The fact that your uh, earlier petition was revoked should not matter. You can, all, of course, double-check this with uh, Customs and Border Protection before you travel. They usually do answer questions. In my experience, CBP is one of the few agencies that does take the phone calls. Okay. Thanks for your input, Raju. You're welcome. Really? Good luck, sir. Good luck. Uh, Khalid 21, question regarding AC 21. Uh, I know that I can port. My question is that I've met all the requirements. Can my current employer... So yeah, your question is, let's say I'm working for IBM. My green card was filed through New York. Now I become eligible for portability. They want to change my location. They want to send me to California. Can I use AC21 portability to change job location? And the answer is yes, absolutely. I don't know of anything that stops from doing that. Unless there's a new policy of some kind, which I haven't heard of, I keep track of everything that's going on. But there's always a possibility I may not. But we have many, many cases like this where the companies moved the employee or companies moved themselves after we had one case, I remember, where the company moved from New Hampshire to Connecticut after 180 days upon our advice. We got the AC-21 done, no issue at all. So yes, we've done it many times before. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, star 5. So no, I disagree with your lawyers. I don't think it should be a problem. They can double check, see if there's something in the law that's come up since Trump came in, but I haven't seen anything I would have known if there was. I do keep track of everything. Okay. So the last posted question from today is uh, from TJS. I'm currently on a J-1 visa. I have I-140 approved under EB-1A. J waiver is accepted. However, 485 date is not current. I could not file 485. J-1 is going to expire in, a, in the next few months. I may lose my visa status. Question is, if USCIS makes the application date current within 30 days. Actually, you have 180 days. Under Section 245K, I won't advise you to go that route. I want you to talk to your lawyers about this. But technically, under Section 245K of Immigration and Nationality Act, K as in kite, you can be out of status for up to 180 days and still file 485. I won't advise it. Talk to your lawyers. Um, if you are an EB1A person, you can always come back on O1. I don't see why that should be a problem if you have a job offer. So all things considered, I don't see why this should be a problem. If the dates become current within the next 30 days during your grace period, absolutely, file your 485. Star 5, if you have a follow-up question, star 5. Okay, folks, I have answered all the posted questions. I've got about 8 minutes. Let's see how many questions we can get. Press star 5 if you have any question. Press star 5. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, so three questions. Those we can do in eight minutes, I'm pretty sure. I'm going in the order in which you folks logged in. So whoever logged in, oh, there's a fourth question. I'll do the best I can, guys. So let's start with the person who logged in the earliest, which is from Denver. So let's see. Okay, I'm having a little difficulty. Seven two zero. 
Okay, 720. Uh, yes, Denver, go ahead, please. Um, hi, Rajiv, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I have a question regarding volunteering on an H-4 visa. Um, so I have recently been offered an unpaid remote volunteering position um, in a 501c3 NGO. Uh, and they oh, absolutely. Audit. Stop, stop. Yeah. You can. No, okay. no question about it. See, if you don't get any remuneration, which means any cash or kind compensation, uh, and you're working for a nonprofit, absolutely go for it. No problem at all. Okay. And does that matter if I've already worked in that domain and they're offering me a role in that domain in which I've no already problem. worked in? Still okay. no problem. Great. Still Great. No problem. And one more question. Let me, let, me, to... let, me, let me embellish on that. If you okay. go to my LinkedIn page, if you go to immigration.com on the top right-hand side panel, you have all my social media links. Um, if you go to our LinkedIn page, one of my earliest articles, just one paragraph, was about volunteering. And I said that you can't volunteer for for-profit. That is problematic under one of the laws. But volunteering for no money or compensation for a nonprofit should not be a problem at all. Okay. Thank you so much. And I just have You're one welcome. more follow-up question. Mm -hmm, so I sure. plan to apply for an F1 visa in the future. Um, and Sure. Why not? As okay. you mentioned, I don't see an issue there, right? So volunteering. I do not, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. I do not see an Thanks. issue. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome. Much. You're not violating status, so it's no issue. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Okay, I'm going to go next to Texas, area code 281. 281, here we go. Yeah, Texas, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I was checking to see whether the criteria for, for qualifying for citizenship after having a green card for several years is more stringent than the qualifications to get a green card. They're totally different. I see. So to give you naturalization criteria, the criteria are simple. You must have had a green card for five years. Check. Uh -huh. uh, second, you must have lived physically in the United States for at least 30 months in the last five years before you apply for the application, which means two and a half years. Right. Check. Yeah. If you have gone outside USA during that time, it should not be more than six months. Check? Yeah. Okay. If you have gone for six months or more, it should, not be, it should always be less than one year, and you must have a good explanation. If you've gone for one year, you have to start your five years all over again. You might even have, missed, uh, you might even have lost your green card. Got it? I uh, had the green card for 30 years. Yeah, so I don't see any problem. Go for it. Yeah, but then citizenship is more stringent in its criteria for, for, uh, for qualification. Oh, you like mean, uh, I think what you're asking me is, is there more scrutiny on the application? Right, or more, 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 more roadblocks, you know? No, not really. I think naturalizations are very easy as long as you meet all the criteria. Unless you have something going back in your background that creates some issues that makes you feel uncomfortable. Most uh, N-400s are very simple applications. Right, but they've got like 20 pages. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. It's still, still quite easy. Okay. Yeah, because okay. Uh, especially as far as, you know, when the green card was applied for, there was a, 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 some kind of an arrest or something like that in the past. But in spite of that, I got a green card. So now on the citizenship... Uh, no, I don't see it that as an issue. Look, first of all, the fact that you got your green card tells me, unless the government made a mis mistake, tells me that that was not an issue for green card. If it was not an issue for green card, it is highly, highly, highly unlikely it will be an issue for your naturalization. So long as you disclose it and let them know that it was... Absolutely. Absolutely. Disclose it. Let them know. I would want you to, uh, where are you, where are, I don't want you to tell me where you're, actually I, I can see where you are, but just get yourself a local lawyer. Let them handle it for you. Get somebody competent. 
they can take care of it for you. See, we have clients all in all 50 states. But if there is an interview necessary and you want somebody to go with you, it's better to get a local lawyer. That's what I was thinking because it will be logistically yeah. difficult for somebody from out of state. Yeah. No, we, we do this. What happens is if somebody's uh, naturalization is very difficult, yours is not. We've had cases where naturalization was very complicated. We will take on the case. We will take care of all the paperwork, but then they will get a local lawyer to go for the interview. We will explain the case to them, talk with the local lawyer, and that takes care of the problem. But unless it's so complicated that a local lawyer cannot handle it and you are stuck in a small city where there are not enough lawyers who practice immigration law, that's a different situation. But if you can get competent local lawyer, go for it. So what is the difference between super lawyer and regular lawyer and board certified and not board certified? There's no such there's no such thing as a super lawyer. That's just most of these super lawyers, you pay money and they put your name in. Okay. Uh, but board certified is good because board, see, not every state has board certifications. So I'm admitted in D.C. and Virginia. We don't have any immigration board certifications. But lawyers who, have, who are practicing in states where there are board certifications, they tend to be fairly competent. So I like that. If I have a board certified lawyer, sure, go for it. And the more experience they've got, like, you know, 30 years as opposed to 10 years, they'd be, be better off, right? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. You see, um, my question always is, do you have 30 years of experience or do you have one year of ex experience 30 times over? So unless you've done new things, you've challenged, you've challenged yourself, then you really have one year experience 30, 30, 30 times over. So it all depends upon their practice. And more importantly, have they handled cases like this before? And having okay. graduated from Ivy League schools like Harvard or, or some Rice University or anything like that? I don't, I don't consider that to be relevant. Look, I think there are two things that go into good practice of law. Uh, number one is competence and number two is attention. They are both equally important. Okay. So you could have the best lawyer in town, but if he's not paying attention to your case, it's not helping. Okay. Competence and, and, and responsiveness. Attention. Attention, attention okay. to the case. Yeah. All right. Good luck, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, last two questions. Now, this one is, again, from Toronto, same uh, individual. So, Toronto, go ahead, please. I, I remember your case, the H-1B issue. Go ahead. Yes, yes, sir. D, uh, I have one question. Who need to pay mm -hmm. DS-260 fees by employer or employee? You can pay it. I don't see any problem with that. Okay, sir. That's all question. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Good luck. All right, the very last question from... Texas. So, uh, Texas, go ahead. Texas. Hey, Raju, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Thank good you afternoon. for taking my call, Raju. Um, my pleasure. This is regarding I-94. So, uh, when mm -hmm. we came in last time to uh, U.S., my kids' I-94 was issued only until March end because their passport okay. is expired. Now okay. we got the passports renewed. Uh, I need to extend their I-94 because the H-4 H okay. visa was stamped until end of 2019. Okay. So what are my okay, options? Yeah, go ahead and either either file I-539. That way you get their H-4 extended all the way to the end of your own H-1. Or mm -hmm. you can just across, go across the border and come back. Government will give you I-94s valid all the way up to the visa stamping. Okay. So since I'm from Texas, I can go to Mexico State, right, at this point in time? Uh, sorry? Uh, since I'm Texas, Houston, uh, close to Mexico border, I can just drive to Mexico border and cross it, right? Is it safe? Yeah, but that will, only, that will only only get you um, H1, uh, I'm sorry, H4 till the end of the visa stamping, which is 2019. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's, you can do that. That's, that's not a problem. Needed. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay. You can do that. Just okay. drive out, drive back in. Okay. Is there any other option if I go to CBP office in International Airport, Houston? Would no. that help me, Raju? No. You've got to physically go outside USA. Uh, in, 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 on the Mexican border, they have a procedure, I forget what it's called, where you don't have to go actually into Mexico. They'll just issue an I-94, but still has to be at the border. Okay. Yeah. And kids need, okay. uh, then, kids need to be present in person, right? Yes, yes, of course. They have to be there. Okay. Yeah. I will try right. that option, Raj. Thank you so much. Good luck, sir. Good luck. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your patience. Today we had a lot of technical glitches. So we've kind of done all sorts of weird things. I have a voice recording. 
I've tried to record the screen, but it may not have my voice on it. We'll see how it goes. We'll definitely have the audio recording for you. I always enjoy talking with you, and I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Every other Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we host um, free community conference calls. Everybody is welcome to join. Some people post questions ahead of time. You can take membership in our forums. Uh, all of the details are there on our website, immigration.com. You can take membership uh, ahead of time. And, um, you know, it's instantaneous. It happens right away. And post your questions beforehand. Or you can just log in. Uh, the phone number in all are provided, 202-800-8394, 1230 Eastern Standard Time, every other Thursday. We have uh, free apps for both Apple iOS platform for your iPhones and iPads as well as for Android. Just look for immigration.com, immigration.com, the period dot, and uh, the application should show up.